in the program. Salam and good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to celebrate with us this important event, Celebrating Arabic. I am Mohammed Abdel Halim, the director of the Center of Islamic Studies. We are very pleased to see all of you here. There are some people in their way. There are, we hear of one particular accident in A5 and so on. So we start now. Now, <clears throat> the Arabic United Nations Day commemorating the uh, adoption of Arabic as an official language of the United Nations falls on the 18th of December, but on the 18th, most of our students have gone home and you would have been busy doing your own Christmas shopping, so we decided to have it this evening, a good decision, I think. Now, Arabic is the leading language at source in terms of the number of students and teachers of the language. It's also the only language now that celebrates that it is celebrated in an annual occasion like this one, thanks to the Center of Islamic Studies. I would like to thank Naama, Naama Bani, who has been organizing this event and working very hard indeed on it. Um, I left it all to her. She had given us very little time for the presentation. We might not be able to stick firmly to the schedule. I would also like to thank the Saudi Cultural Bureau in London, who will be joining us to celebrate this evening. And indeed, indeed, they are providing all the delicious food which we will enjoy at the end of the event, which will make celebrating Arabic even the more highly welcome. Uh, the, the, I, I would have been pleased to offer the cultural attaché, the Saudi cultural attaché, the opportunity to speak, but they are delayed. There is an accident apparently on the A5. However, you see, we have very good relations with the Saudi Cultural Bureau. The, we have a good number of students at SOAS studying for masters and PhDs financed by the Saudi Ministry of Education through the Cultural Bureau. And we, uh, there are quite a number of SOAS uh, alumni who uh, yani report to the Cultural Bureau that they have this very warm attachment to SOAS, and some of them are even with us celebrating this evening, so thanks for the Saudi Cultural Bureau, and we now begin our presentations. I have asked Hela Naama to put me at the end, but she put me at the beginning, and asked me, I have to say yes, because I left it all to her. Now, she, I am scheduled to talk about the most effective way of teaching and learning Arabic and other languages big task, but I will do my best relying on my personal experience. I will speak to you first about effective teachings in England, as I saw it, and then I will take you back to Egypt to talk about effective teaching and learning in a different tradition, equally effective in its own context. Now, in England, I came to Cambridge many years ago to study at Cambridge, having done all my education in Arabic in Egypt and started working there. No English except for very few sentences which meant nothing. And then I was given a scholarship to come to Cambridge on the understanding that I will spend some time first learning the English language in Cambridge. I was given the address of a teacher and I went to her home. She received me very well and we sat down for her to find out the level or the extent of my knowledge or lack of knowledge of the English language. So she started reading from a text, first line where the word sheep, sheep occurred. She asked me, do you know what a sheep is? I said, no. So she said, bah. Sure enough, there and then, 
I learned for the first time what a sheep was. It was done so immediately, so efficiently, so effortlessly, most profoundly effective, and never to be forgotten after that. If you stop me now anywhere after all these years and ask me, do you know what a sheep is? I will say, yes. Bah. <laughs> now, how many of our students can remember what their teachers taught them only last week? <laughs> Not many. The, the voice, the audio effect was enchanting. I grew up in a village and we had many sheep, but I had never heard any of them say, bah so beautifully as that blonde English teacher in Cambridge many years ago. She made me think that English is easy and is a joy to learn. Now, we often hear students here say, Arabic is very difficult to learn. I would say to them, your teacher should use the same method used by my blonde English teachers in Cambridge years ago, and all problems will be solved. Now, after a while, I had a second teacher of English, a man this time, very knowledgeable, but I can tell you I don't remember anything of what he told me, taught me, except, except for one thing. One afternoon, he wanted to train me to pronounce English vowels properly. So he asked me to repeat the sentence, we mean to see the queen. Three times, we mean to see the queen, which I did not meaning any such a thing at the time, it would have been beyond the wild imagination of a foreigner who had just been taught bah to mean to see the Queen of Great Britain. And yet, and yet, recently, in recent years, I did actually have the great honor of seeing the Queen three times, as the man has asked me to repeat. On the last occasion, I went to the palace to receive an OBE, and just as I approached the palace, the old sentence flashed into my mind, and I said to myself, we mean to see the queen. <laughs> Sound, audio effect is very important. Visual effect is also important. I paid attention to this when I started teaching language in Arabic some years ago. And then we had a, a colleague, very cheerful, a tall East European lecturer who taught Swahili. One day I came into Sous and as I stepped into the lift, I found him standing there hugging a large, colorful Ida down, which he had just bought in the sale. So I said to him, oh, visual aid. He laughed and said to me, I don't know what you teach in your Arabic classes. I walked out with him to his office and said to him, Use this either down, take it to the class, teach your students about it, get them to clutch it and teach them the word to clutch. Sniff it and teach them the word to sniff. Spread it, jump on top of it and teach them the, the, the words for that. Throw it out of the window and teach them the words for that. Go down and get it back and teach them a whole range of life experience about which the students will have no chance to learn without an Ida down. I think our students should insist or should demand that their teachers come to class well equipped with effective visual aid. So much for what can I say, what I can say about teaching, effective teaching in England. I take now back to Egypt where I had my education. In the village, I learned the Quran by heart and then I applied to one of the schools of Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar is a very famous institute for teaching Arabic and Islam. And one day my father received a letter congratulating him that I have passed, I have been accepted. I should attend on the first day of term wearing the official uniform, a turban and a cloak, which is called Kakola in Arabic, Kakola. Not to be confused with Coca-Cola, just Kakola and bring with me the books, required books. My father, who had been through the same system of education before, had bought all the books and came to give me advice. I was surprised to see there were five 
short text like this, little booklet. This was my introduction to a tradition of writing, a genre of writing in Islamic teaching and education, which has been there for at least 12 centuries. According to which scholars, good scholars, after writing extensively about the subject, will write a condensed form of the whole subject. Very abstract, abstract very condensed form of the information about the subject in a short text in prose or in verse, which young students would learn by heart, which means they take the information in their head and it will be there with them for a long time. My father said to me, now, my father had been to the same system of education before, so he said to me now, here are five of these texts you learn by heart every day, five, seven lines from this, seven from this, seven from this, seven from this, every day until you finish them. By this, you will have all the basic information in your mind, and when you come to the exams, if you forget everything else and just produce what is here, the examiner will not be able to fail you. Clearly at that time, even at that time, I had a keen yani, desire to frustrate all examiners and render them incapable of failing me. So I, at once, I set out and learned the whole lot by heart. Great. You know, this little text written 12 centuries ago by a judge in Afghan in uh, Isfahan contains only, you, you need to know the basic information about the whole body of Islamic law. The whole body of Islamic law in this little text. You know it by heart and there. And these texts were written about varieties of subjects. I had to learn one on Aristotelian logic. And I still remember lines up to now. I used to sing it while I'm revising in order to make it even more firmly rooted in my mind. <coughs> I can recite to you, repeat. العكس قلب جزء القضية مع بقاء الصدق والكيفية والكم إلا الموجب الكلية عوضوها الموجب الجزئية. That's what I used to do. You needed a large room to revise. Because if you are so close to the wall, you might break your finger. And I don't think I would have been allowed to revise this in the reading room of South Library. <clears throat> but it was great. Now, come to this fantastic little booklet. Arabic grammar, the entire body of Arabic grammar in this small booklet written by an Andalusian grammarian nearly eight centuries ago, eight centuries ago. He reduced all the information about Arabic grammar in 1,000 line, 1,000 line of verse. And hence it's called alfiya after the word alf. Alf in Arabic means a thousand. Alf, the abbreviation of alfred if you like. A thousand lines of verse in this and you learn it and it is there. I can repeat to you, our students will know there is a chapter called Kana, the verb Kana, and its sisters. Tarfa'u kana al mubtadasman wal khabar, tansibuhu ka kana sayyidan umar, ka kana dhalla bata adha asbaha, amsa wa sara laysa zala bariha, etc., etc. All the information, rules, a long list of verbs and examples in this great text, I think. All our students should buy a copy of this, sold in Old Cairo for 10 pence, 10 pence for the Arab, for Arabic grammar. If you have that, you, it will give you Arabic grammar more immediately than you will get from the three large volumes of Owen Wright's Arabic grammar. <laughs> in any case, the three volumes cost more than 10 pence, and they will not last for 800 years like this text. And then they are bulky. With this one, you can pocket all Arabic grammar and walk out of soul. Fantastic idea, which really has gone on for centuries. And as I said, it keeps the information in our mind. <coughs> this practice of learning these texts by heart, 
were useful for all students, particularly for blind students. In Al-Azhar, quite a lot of blind students were there. In the, in the Islamic tradition, the blinds have an honorable profession as reciters of the Quran and teachers of religious subjects. I sat in a class for nine years. I sat in a class which included three categories of students, sighted, blind, and semi-blind. All sitting together next to me here, one blind and next, perhaps here, another one. Amazing experience when I think of it now. Really advanced thinking that blinds and semi-blinds should be in the same class as everybody else. Sometimes you had to go for mathematics an hour and then come back and join them. It so happened in my case, <clears throat> there was a boy, a blind boy from our village with, the same, with me in the same class. We were together most of the time, most of the day. I want to revise, so I read out loudly for myself and for him to get the information. For nine years, we did this. Then we had blind teachers as well, blind teachers, who knew all this heart by heart as, as young students. I remember in particular a very distinguished man called Sheikh Nasr, who taught us commentaries on the Quran. He used to come to the class, very smartly dressed, beautiful turban. His wife must have looked after him very well, and he deserved it. <coughs> He really was a very, a man, an unusual man. <clears throat> he asked me to read a few lines, and then he gives his commentaries. Individual way of analyzing text, and then excellent articulation of Arabic and good voice. We loved this teacher. We used to look at them with vener veneration because they were teaching the religious knowledge and the Quran. We saw them as people who have blessing from God. For your interest in Al-Azhar, we, whenever we met our teachers as students, we will greet them by kissing their hand. And they, it's a tradition, so readily they will make it available <laughs> for us like that. I have been teaching as those for decades. Not one single student <laughs> has kissed my hand <laughs> or thought of it. And I wouldn't even think of it because if I do, they might complain and the student union may occupy the office of the director <laughs> in protest. So I keep the peace and stick to the tradition here and the tradition there. Two different traditions. Each is effective in its way. I am fortunate, really, that I have taken the religious education in Al-Azhar and kissed the hands of my teachers, and then <coughs> came here to take that land in the tradition of the British, which started in Cambridge with my blonde teacher telling me bah! more softly than what I said now. <coughs> Two different, each effective. This is very effective way of learning and as I said, I don't think it would be possible to introduce it here, but here it is if you are interested. Or I, I could now <coughs> have to watch the time. <coughs> For Arabic students, I give you three advice. Number one, you should rem always remember <coughs> the Arabic order of the alphabet and repeat Alif, ba. This is number one. Number two, you should always repeat, we mean to see the queen or at least the prime minister. Aim high, first class honors, or at least upper second class, the prime minister. <laughs> Number three, remember, the student of Arabic, that the verb kana in Arabic has 12 sisters, but not one single brother. Gender imbalance, imbalance. I leave you with this imbalance. Interesting enough, interesting sentence. If I say I leave you with imbalance, who will be in imbalance? Me, I or you? In Arabic, it's, it's either, it can be right, depending on what the speaker has in his mind. We say it's inside him, the mind is inside him. Or we say in Arabic more affect, affectionately, 
وسي المعنى في بطن الشاعر the meaning is inside the stomach of the poet inside the stomach of the poet and I would advise I would advise students when you sit to answer exam questions don't leave the meaning inside the بطن الشاعر cuff it out cuff it out on the page cuff which is in Egyptian colloquial كح not كح but كح come on كح كح come on كح Carry on coughing. Thank you very much. Now, I will sit down and relax and ask my colleague, Professor Bruce Ingham, who is a Emeritus Professor of Arabic Linguistics, to come and talk to you about Bedouin Arabic, some characteristics. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, I think my talk won't be as amusing as Abdul Halim's, but I'll try. Um, so I've been asked to talk about the, the dialect of the Bedouins, um, which I can do to some extent. Uh, but first of all, who are the Bedouins? We hear about them a lot. It's a name used, uh, you know, in, in many, many, many uh, contexts. Really, a Bedouin is defined as a camel-herding nomad from the Arabian Peninsula. Some of these also keep sheep, but that doesn't matter. To be a Bedouin, you have to also definitely have to have camels. I think the term is not used in North Africa, although there are people there who are the same. I mean, they're camel-herding nomads. I don't think they call themselves Bedou. Maybe they call themselves Arab, which is a name which means very often the same thing. Um, in, also in, in uh, Iraq particularly, there are, there are nomads who uh, herd sheep. So they're not Bedouins. They're called actually Shawi, from the word Shat, which means a sheep. Um, and the plural is, is, they've got three plurals. Everybody knowing Arabic in the first year will like to know this, broken plurals. So the plural of Shawi is either Shawiya or Shawaya or Shuyan. Many Arabic words, as you know, have more than one plural, just there to annoy you. Um, do the Bedouins all have the same dialect? Well, no, they don't, obviously. To some extent, actually, particular tribes have their own dialect, but even then, they, they share them with each other sometimes. Um, but those which I, I've studied are the ones in the north and center of, a, of the Arabian Peninsula, basically Saudi Arabia, share certain features. Now, I shall have to get, take my watch off so I don't go on too long. Okay. These, these features actually also share with the settled population of Central Arabia or Nejd. So the, the Bedouin dialects in the north are really the same as the Nejd dialects. So we've got some people here today, at least one I know, who is from Nejd, and he can probably tell you that this is true. Um, why should they have similar dialects? Well, mainly it's because they actually do stay in contact with each other quite a lot. Um, in the old days, Bedouins moved around in the same circles, even if they were different tribes, so they tended to sort of have similar dialects. Even today, when many of them are not nomads and actually are settled people, they still move in the same circles, and very often their, their, their contact is, is reinforced by, by uh, marriage. Bedouins don't all marry people from their own tribe by any means, but they sometimes... They very often um, marry other similar tribes, so there is a, a lot of contact goes on amongst them. Okay, so, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of ways we could look at this. One thing that often characterizes these, these dialects and those of uh, Nedd is that they're rather archaic, meaning that in some ways they actually have some resemblance to classical Arabic. That's not to say by any means that they are classical Arabic, and people um, very often think this is true. The Bedouins don't speak classical Arabic, but they, they speak a dialect very often which has some, some resemblance to it. Uh, so what do I mean by archaic? That, that, that's what I mean. Um, is that visible? Good, yeah. So one thing, for instance, uh, which, which they often have is, is tanween or nunation. Um, 
most of our, our students here find it very difficult to, to get the hang of this three uh, cases, the, what, what could be called nominative, accusative and genitive, uh, or marfu and mansub and, and majroor. Uh, but anyway, classical Arabic has three. So the, the word kitab can have kitabun, which is the nominative, kitaban, which is the accusative, and kitabin, which is the genitive. And they have certain functions. The Nejdi and Bedouin dialects very often actually have a sort of um, reduced form of this in that they have an ending in. So, for instance, they can say kitabin. Uh, and that just means a book. All it marks is indefinite. It doesn't mark cases as it does in classical Arabic. So, you know, kitabin would be quite all right for a book. And you have the example there on the left, the um, kitabin zain. If I touch this, does it show up on here? No, it doesn't. Have we got a way of, of pointing at things? Never mind. So, anyway, how the kitab in Zain means this is a good book. Zain means good. It's actually a word which often has the meaning of beautiful as well. Um, or I've got these, these quotes from various stories which I've record, recorded. So, we have here that quote, how the go min mata'arif base. These are an enemy who do not know base. Base is a character in the story. And uh, so he expects everyone to know him. Gom is a word which is like gom, meaning people. But in fact, in this style, it often means enemy. Uh, we have a couple down here as well. Yom jal hithrubi wil abaytu mifjujin min indir rafa. That means when al hithrubi arrived, behold, his, uh, his tent was torn apart down the middle seam. So it's a complicated story, but anyway, this was a great insult, okay? Or over here, Yajilu Anaziyin Fil Mazma. He came um, to uh, an Anazi Bedouin in the desert. So you see we've got here um, Mafjujin, meaning torn apart. You've got the in on the end. And over there you've got Anaziyin and Anazi in the desert. So that you've got this, this uh, reduced form of Tanween. This is remarkable because, in fact, most Arabic dialects don't have this at all. So it's really only Central Arabia and the Bedouins that have, that have got it. To some extent, I think also North Africa has it slightly differently. I mean, the desert people of, of North Africa. Another feature is the internal passive. Again, first-year students, you've not, have you done the passive yet? I think some of you have, anyway. But um, so, for instance, in classical Arabic, you have an internal way of forming the passive. Are you change the vowels? So, for instance, qala, he said, qila, it was said. Kataba, he wrote, kutiba, it was written. Now, a reduced form of this again occurs in uh, the Bedouin and Nejdi dialects. Sometimes it, it results in a change of the consonant as well. So, for instance, you have here, gal, he said, zil, it was said. Kitab, he wrote, ktib, it was written. Or, you know, using the verb qal, meaning to, to uh, name somebody, yigalu khalid, he is called khalid. So you've got the same, that yagul becomes yigal, okay? So, it, and it's, it actually very closely resembles classical Arabic, but of course the consonants are often different. So they don't have a qaf, they have a ga. And the ga, as you see in the word zil, sometimes becomes a ta. Okay, wrong way. Certain other things also are uh, preserved, which are, give it a resemblance to classical Arabic. Certain features or, or particles. So, uh, one of my favorite words in classical Arabic is qad, because it always makes it look nicer if you put a qad before, before a verb. So, for instance, in classical Arabic, you say qad wasala, he has a, or had arrived. And um, also, you've got this idha thing. <clears throat> which is what we call a presentative particle, which means something like behold or lo or whatever, pointing to somebody. So you can say, Idha bi Muhammadin ja. Behold, Muhammad had arrived. Okay? This, these things are still occur in these dialects. Again, in a, uh, a slightly changed form. So the Bedouin Nejdi one would say, uh, not qad wasala, but zid wasal. Okay? So the, the qa has become a za. This is a, this is a sound change which has occurred. And also you can have this example here. 
Um, again, another story, uh, which it would take a long time to explain. But Yom Agbalo al Majlis, will ya haduma tatubbil gaz? When he approached the Majlis, Majlis is like a meeting room, behold, his robes trailed along the ground. This obviously in those days, if you had, if you were rich, you had long clothes that dragged along the ground. If you were poor, you didn't. Um, so this is the point of saying this. So this wilya is like the iza that you have in classical Arabic. And also, what is known as the the ba at tawkid, it's the the ba which um, emphasizes a negative in some ways. So, for instance, in classical Arabic, you have two ways of marking negation in a non-verbal sentence. These are bih and uh, ma and ma bih. Okay, so you can say, for instance, somebody's not hardworking, you can say ma huwa mujtahid or ma huwa bimujtahid. So the bih is, doesn't really add anything, but it's an alternative way of making negative. Southern parts of Saudi Arabia, whether Bedouins or non-Bedouins, and also on the, on the Gulf Coast, very often still have this. So, um, and it's not really found in many other parts of the Arab world. So, for instance, if you want, the example there is Mahib Hi Yalamir. It is not so, O Prince. The B in the middle there is the, this thing marking the negative. I think, I think we've got about that far in the first year. Uh, or the example, again, very much sort of a Bedouin type example. Somebody was talking about praising a camel. And they said, Mashin Babrak Min Han Naga. Nothing is more blessed than this, uh, this, this camel, she camel. Uh, blessed means, of course, useful in this context. It's got, uh, people often say, for it has got blessing, means it's useful or it'll last a long time, something like that. You can say it about, don't have to say it about camels, you could say it about a pair of shoes if they last a long time. Okay, um, another interesting thing is, the, is colors. Um, when I was in, in Saudi Arabia once, I think it was in 1984, I was staying with some, some uh, Bedouin, a Bedouin family um, of the Al-Murra tribe who had lots of camels. And I was fascinated by it because they were all different colours. Um, they all had names, by the way. They were all female, so all their names ended in Ah. Um, but anyway, the, the colours I, f I found fascinating. To me, they all looked really like a, a duffel coat colour, you know, sort of fawn or something. Uh, but they all had they had had adjectives which would have, which, which could describe them. So I'll just go through them here. So basically, um, they divided into two sorts: light camels and dark camels. The B and the, the the C thing there. And I'll read them and just give you the translation. Um, so ashkah meant white. Again, you could have feminine shagha and plural sugar. I won't do that for everyone. Then the, the, the light ones are called Meratir. And then amongst, uh, within that, you had various ones. So you had Asham, which was a sort of speckled light fawn. I, I can say this because I would look at a camel and say, what's that called? They would tell me and I'd write a note down and say speckled light fawn. You see. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to recognize one another time. Uh, Ashkar, which meant fawn. And of course, that's used for people, isn't it? For blonde. Uh, so Ashkar is a, is a common word, in, it would be Ashkar, of course, in, in classical Arabic. Amgar, which was a darker fawn colour. Um, Hamar, which is, is of course Ahmar, red. But it, obviously it wasn't like a, you know, a letterbox. It was, a, it was basically a rather deep brown. Um, so that's Hamar. And then you've got Asfar, which is yellow. Obviously it wasn't yellow the way we, we see it, but anyway. So all of these are gradations within a sort of fawn color, basically. Some of these words um, we know in classical Arabic have slightly different meaning. Some of them I don't think occur in classical. They're just specifically, you know, for this dialect. Back again. Okay. Um, at the bottom we said the, the, the <coughs> majahim were dark camels. Michim, I think, actually means large, and these were big, uh, hefty, uh, dark camels, and they had uh, special padded feet which allowed them to get across the empty quarter. So they were really a, another a breed, but anyway, they, they had these adjectives to describe them. So you have, you know, again, asfar, yellow, ashab, which was, again, something between uh, sufur and, and, uh, and sud, between I, these other two. Very difficult to describe, really. I, there's no equivalent in English. It's between yellow and the other one. 
two minutes. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> two minutes, okay, that won't, t won't take me that long. And Amlah, which is a speckled black camel. Um, I, I thought, why, do, why are they called Amlah? Milih means uh, salt. And I thought, it's salt that color. Then I realized from a story I'd heard, Amlah, Milih meant gunpowder. And, you know, so and gunpowder is a mixed thing. You get black and white. So that's why they're called that. Okay. And of course, that's what is black. Okay. So uh, the last thing I'm going to do, Abdul Halim, is read a poem. Okay. It won't take me long. This is a love poem. And uh, I, I was, when I was um, doing research in Kuwait in 1977, I went to the university and I met some, some Bedouin students. And, you know, I was asking them words and this sort of thing. And one of them said, wouldn't you like, what about a poem? Would you like a poem? I said, oh, yes. And they said, well, this is a ghazal, um, you know, a love poem. And it's a very short one. And in fact, the same poem occurs in a book about the Sinai Arab uh, dialects. So these things travel very well and, and purely oral. Now they're written down, of course. And if a, if a poem is good, it'll, it'll travel really fast in that context. So I'll read you this, this poem. You'll see there's a ch, like an Arabic, and like a, um, a Persian letter in there. It's actually not ch, it's ts. So they will say, Yal'ain litzbal hawa lefta, manti ala dina lichwani, balads min wahdin shifta, udha min azayn rawyani, al kehal bil'ain sayifta, aswad tigil rish khirbani, was silts bathob hayifta, tigil masahib dibani. Um, and you can see the meaning of it here. So it's interesting partly because it is, it's got um, completely Bedouin desert sort of imagery, hasn't it? Uh, he says, you know, you're, you are, he, he, he talks to his own eye. He says, you, your eye is wandering off because you've, you've been distracted by love. You are no longer following the religion of, of the Ikhwan. The Ikhwan, that points it to 1920s actually probably. Because that's when the Ikhwan, who were a, a puritanical um, sect, were, were very much in ascendance. Thank you. Um, this second line, he, uh, the poet <coughs> compares the girl to a, a, a young plant, okay? And he says, Balaat bin Wahdin Shifta, Ud Hamanazain Rawyani. As though that a plant which has drawn up water from the soil. Okay, so he, he compares her to, to a plant, um, uh, and he, in her case, he, she's drawn up beauty, not water. In place of water, she's drawn up beauty. Al kital bil ain sayifta, she has uh, uh, drawn. This is antimony, obviously eyeshadow, basically on her eye. Aswad tigil rish khirbani, which is black like the, the feathers of a crow. Incidentally, that tigil thing is taqul. You would say it was the feathers of a crow, but it's their way of saying like. Was silsba thob hayifta, tigil masahib divani. She has sewn a, a border on the bottom of her skirt, presumably, um, which looks like the tracks of a, of a snake in the sand. So obviously it's one of these things going around like that. Okay. Anyway, so I think it's a very nice poem, very simple. You can all learn it. And, and shukran jazeelan. Thank you. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Harim. My deep thanks to... Uh, uh, Sawas University, London University, and to the uh, Saudi Arabian Cultural Attaché, Dr. Abdul Aziz is here. Thank you so much for inviting me here today to celebrate <clears throat> Arabic language in this really international important day. And Arabic, of course, created or played a major, a ma very important role in history and in our spiritual life also. And it is really a very important in our lives for Muslims, Christians, and it is the language which really convey <coughs> and build the bridges between the Greek, the ancient Greek science for, to the Middle East, and then from there to Latin to Europe again. Today I'm going to talk about the development of Arabic or the changes in modern Arabic, actually. 
Sorry, just put the timer so Dr. Abdul Halim doesn't need to remind me. <clears throat> uh, today I'm going to talk about briefly, of course, as, as the time allows me, to about the development of Arabic language between West Arab world and East Arab world. Of course, um, I'm going to talk today about standard Arabic as used in the modern time and in today time. I'm not going, of course, to concentrate on the pers perspective side of the language itself, as some people are so interested because they always like to go back to the rules and everything. I'm not against the rules. I'm also with the rules. But of course, we know society is the one which really changes the language, not the grammarian, not the linguist, the society itself, life itself, social life is changing language and developing language. I have monitored for some time, really, the standard Arabic in both sides, in West and East, in Arab world. And I'm going to take today uh, Saudi Arabia as an example of the, of the Eastern Arabic. And I'm going to take Morocco as an example of the Western Arabic, mm -hmm. to compare between them. And uh, <clears throat> of course, I'm going to not to take also the, da the daily dialect or the slang. I'm not going to take this. I'm going to take the standard as written in the uh, daily written text, like in newspapers or like in the e-newspapers. Because of the time, I'm going to concentrate also on the semantic uh, area more than actually talking about syntax. If I talk about syntax, that will take time. That will, be, that will need really more complicated and more detailed study. There are many reasons why Arabic, we see that is Arabic is growing in two sides. They are differently, little bit, between that side and that side. Of course, not the language itself, but in some areas, in some semantic fields, and in using the, the words from the dictionary, which word each society they select from the, the Arabic dictionary to use it in their daily language and their standard language. There are many, many reasons. One of the reasons, of course, is the heritage itself. Let's say the, 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 the dictionary of the cultural heritage of the society which provide the society with the words. Maybe I can give you a word like kunash which is still used till today as compiled book or as a compiled regulations or acts putting together. It's still used actually in, in, in Morocco, in Algeria, but it's not used anymore at all in Eastern, uh, uh, in Eastern Arab world. It was used about 600 years ago. Now it's not used anymore. Some of the influence came from the jurisprudence. For example, in Morocco, they always use, of course, the Maliki school of in, in jurisprudence, and they take words more from the text of the Malikiya more than the others who take text maybe from, uh, from uh, uh, other side of the fiqh. I'm going to go to this now. Let's see, for example, this is, the, of course, where Arabic language is spoken as a daily language, as a main language. We are take the, the far east there and the far east here, the far west here as example for this. The changes, I'm going to cover some of them. Let's start with this one, for example. Number one, I'm going to start with the new words. When I see new words that is, are used in, 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 in Morocco, for example, or in Algeria, it doesn't mean that is, these words do not exist at all in the East, but it means these are the daily used words. Then the, the, the Arabs in Saudi Arabia, Arabs in Saudi Arabia are using other words. For example, when I put the, the letter Ghain, it means Al Gharb. When the letter Sheen, it means Sharq. Then they use, for example, the word mastara. Mastara, if you, if you say mastara in, in, in Egypt or in Saudi Arabia or in Syria, they will, they will understand from the ruler. While if you say it in, in, in Morocco, it means uh, legislations or compile acts. And that's why they say mastarat al-usra. Mastarat, that means majmu'at qawaneen. Again, another word, the word tasir. In, in, uh, East, Eastern Arabic, they use the word idara instead of tasir for the word management, which means management. Tasir, idara, both of them are Arabic, both of them from dictionary. But for a reason or another, the, 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 the Western Arab use that word and the Eastern Arab use this word for the same meaning. So you see that the dictionary is going, is going to be selective. They are taking this word and they leave the other one. There are many reasons for this, of course. Then we have here a strange little bit word for some of you. That means uh, in West, they, they use the word itar. Itar has different meaning totally, and of course, in Eastern Arabic. It means a qualified person. They say it, for example, utur al-wazara, qualified people of the ministry. 
Now we are so far no capable or so no derive majmuat min utar al wazara. We are going to train a group of qualified people, for example, or meet qualified people from that ministry or from that uh, from that university. They use the word utar and itar. Plural is utar. The the singular is is itar for qualified person. While in in Eastern Arabic they use shakhs muahal or kafaa sometimes. The word murakab stadium murakab. In East, they use Malab or Ustad Riyadh. Ustad, of course, it came from the stadium. It's, it's uh, the same word, but change, of course, the Arabized word to be Ustad Riyadh. The other one, they use the Murakkab. For example, Murakkab Medinat Ad Dar al Bayda. This is the stadium of the uh, Casablanca city. Now, we go to the first one. I give some examples. Of course, I have many of these, but this is, I just select some, some examples, four or five for each field I'm going to discuss. Now, the word Ta'adudiyya. Ta'adudiyya. Instead of that word, in East, they use Jam'iyya Ta'awniyya, while in Morocco or in Mauritania, they use the word Ta'adudiyya. Ta'adudiyya, from the word Avud, Avud is upper arm, of course, then Avadahu, that means support him. Or it's, it's purely Arabic. It's Arabic and correct, of course. They use it for cooperative organization. Ta'adudiyya, for example, Nisa'iyya, that means cooperative organization for women. Mm. This is, these are the words, example of the words that is they use in the West, but they don't use them at all in the East. Now I come to semantic changes, actually. That means using one word for wider meaning. I know some people will be surprised about these words, to those especially who never pay attention to this. The word rawda, for example, in East means garden, of course. While if you go to Morocco, it means garden also, but it means also cemetery. Cemetery. Same, same word. And the word wajib, which means duty in Arabic, it means also duty, but it means also the fees. If you say, he hasn't paid the fees of the university. It means wajib here. Wajib, it's it, because maybe paying the fees is a duty, that's why they take the word wajib from the first meaning and widening the meaning to another, another very close uh, word here. The word muhim, important, which is everywhere important, east and west, of course, but there, uh, sometimes you see in the newspaper the word muhim used actually for different meaning, to, 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 uh, to mean sometimes too big or too much. Yani for example, I was reading a newspaper, they said, shariba, shariba miqdaran muhimman min al-kuhul. How come alcohol is very important? He drank something. If you cannot literally understand that way. It means, or he meant, that is he drank, of course, too much of alcohol. But they say miqdaran muhimman. And it's used in many texts, actually. Muhim, to mean, to, to, to mean big or to mean too much. And plus also to mean uh, important, as is the original meaning in, in, in Arabic. So this is another, another change, the semantic changes for the meaning. Now we go to this one morphological changes. I have taken some plural to show you actually the differences between the two sides. The word zabun, which means client or customer in Arabic. If you go into uh, east, the, the plural is zabain. Zabain al-mahal, zabain al sharika clients of the company, for example. While if you go there, the plural is zubana. Zubana al sharika That means the clients of the company. Same word. Same word, but the plural is different. Now, the second one is bank. Bank is bank, as we know it, all of us. <laughs> the plural is bunuk. This is in, actually in East. If you go to West, the plural is abnak. They call them hayat al-abnak al-mahalliya, for example. Corporation or commission of the local banks. And they use the plural abnak instead of bunuk. They don't use bunuk, they use abnak. While the Eastern Arab, they don't use abnak, they use bunuk. Then we come to warsha, which means work, work, workshop. Plural there in East is Warshat, while the Western, I don't know why, they choose the plural actually Awrash. They say Warshat Amal, workshop, for example, Warshat Amal in a, in a, in a, in a conference, Warshat Fil 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 Mu'tamar, they call it Awrash Al Mu'tamar instead of Warshat Al Mu'tamar. Mm -hmm. So the same word, but the morphological change mm -hmm. come in plural itself, moving from one to another. Another example. Now we have also, this is very interesting really, a new derivatives from the same words. This is creating, this is actually 
magnificent, uh, let's say, side of Arabic language itself, because Arabic language is deriving words from words, and that's why in Arabic we see many uh, thousands, if not millions, of synonyms and antonyms, actually, because of the derivation which is the language is using. Let's go to, to the first word, which is aqd. Aqd min zaman Now, decayed. Aqd min zaman means decayed in, in, in Arabic. This is used everywhere in, in Eastern uh, Arab, Arab world. If you go to the West, sometimes you find the word Ushariya. في العشرية الأولى من القرن الماضي, in the first decade of the last century, where the Ushariya, the word Ushariya came from the word Ashara, means ten. Ten, which comes, of course, to decade, ten years. That's, that's, the, 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 that's how the word came from. Now, we come to Jam'iya Khairiya. Sometimes they used, and they use it here in London. You see it sometimes in some uh, of the uh, charity commissions. Uh, uh, registered in the charity commission organization, the charity organization here, they are registered at the, with the name of Widadiyya. Widadiyya, of course, it came from the word wid, wid means love, or you like somebody. This is the meaning of it. Widadiyya, it means a group of people, they like each other and they work together and they come together. So they use the word Widadiyya, which is the, the derive, they, they, they derive it from, from the same root, which is correct. Another word is al-khurda, scrap. Scrap, I believe, of course, in Eastern Arabic, they used the, the word khurda, which is, I believe, a Turkish word originally. And if you go there to the, to, to the west, to Morocco, you, they, they use the word mutalashiyat. Mm. Mutalashiyat, which is a very nice word. Mutalashiyat, of course, the word mutalashiyat came from, the, from la shay. From la shay, they derive a verb, talasha, that means asbah la shay. Of course, this der derivative word came, came in the, during the Abbasid time. It's not new. That is actually when they, when they translated the philosophical text, they needed this word. So they, from la shay, that means nothing, null, then they, they, they made a fi'l yatalasha. Now, in modern Arabic, in standard Arabic in Morocco and Mauritania and Algeria and that area, let's say in the West, they use for scrap, they use the word mutalashiyat. That means the things that is there. You, you don't need them. They are damaged and you will throw them. Now, we come to a strange word, which is actually in East. I don't know another word exactly precisely to describe it, but we can express the same meaning in many words. For schooling, they use the word tamadrus. Tamadrus is a new word derived from the word madrasa. And they say, we have to talk about how important schooling is important for children between, for example, six uh, years till, till, till 15, whatever. They, they use the word tamadrus. Tamadrus is derived from, from madrasa, which is never, never used actually in the Eastern text of the Arabs at all. So you see the language? Two more minutes. Okay, that's what I need. See that the language is developing itself with the new words to meet the new word like schooling for a new meaning. While I put question mark here because you can you can express the same meaning in different way. For example, at the habi al madrasa, at tasjil fil madaris, at dukhul awal inziwa ila al madaris wa taalim. I think this is the last this is the last change. This is actually this is some of the of the observations I have made between standard Arabic between east and west, and we can see that is the same dictionary is growing in different sides. Each one is selecting some words for that side. Sometimes they use the same word for different meaning. Sometimes they go the same dictionary and they take two words for the same meaning and each one they divide it and each one takes one side. Many reasons for this. One of the reasons, of course, is the influence of, our, of other languages. In, in North Africa, we know there is influence from, the, <clears throat> from French as a foreign language. And there is, of course, an influence from, from the local languages, the original one, the Barbary language, which is used, of course, in, in, in all North Africa. And there is also another, uh, actually, influence come from the, from the dialects themselves, or from the slang uh, uh, used every day. I think I, I shall I stop here. Yeah, th this is actually some, some aspects of the growth of Arabic language today as a standard language in both sides. And as I said to you in the beginning, I have taken only the written text. I didn't cover the verbal text or the slang or the, the daily dialect to show how the development of Arabic language is going now to cover all the new needs and the modern needs in both societies, 
every society is trying to develop the language in their own way according to what they need and according to, to the new challenges they have in their society. Thank you very much to Abdul Harim. Thank you very much to Industry. Everybody, can you please? We are going to listen to music. This requires listening.
they say in Arabic, Al-Shi'ru Diwan Al-Arab. Poetry is the record of the Arabs. The record of their life, their history, from the pre-Islamic times until our present day. Poetic creativity is not easy. The creative poet needs wide knowledge. He also needs a strong command of the language. But this is not enough. He needs inspiration. Inspiration can be found in peoples, in ideas, in events, in places. Inspiration is found in beautiful places, in magic places. One of the greatest inspiring places to Arab poets throughout the ages is the city of Damascus. Its history, its people, and its beauty. Al Khawarizmi said, and I'll quote him first in Arabic, he said, Mutanazahatu dunya arba'atu mawadi'a. Rotatu dimashq, wa nahru al abla, wa shi'bu bawan, wa samar qant. The gardens of the world are in four locations. Of course, we are talking about the old world, the 10th century. Maybe Hyde Park has to be. <laughs> the gardens of the world are in four locations, the Gauta of Damascus, the river Abla near Basra. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. The pass of Bawan in Persia, and Samarkand in Central Asia. Can you hear me there? Damascus, Asham, inspired most, if not all, the great Arab poets. An Nabi Ghazubiani, Hassan bin Thabit, Abu Tammam, Al Buhturi, the great Al Mutanabbi, and many others. But we have to come to the 20th century because we don't have time. We have limited time. Professor Harim will tell me to stop in 20 minutes. I've, all, I've already uh, used five of them. <laughs> I'm going to read extract from four 20th century Arab poets. And Sophia, who is a Sawa's fourth year student of Arabic, will read a translation which he herself, she herself, sorry, which she herself put in English. I will start with Amir Shu'ara, Ahmad Shawqi, the Prince of Poets, the Poet of Kings. He was inspired by beauty in Andalusia, in Istanbul, in Lebanon, but he composed more poems to Damascus. He says in one. وانشد رسم من بانو مشت على الرسم أحداث وأزمان بنو أمية للأنباء ما فتحوا وللأحاديث ما سادوا وما دانوا كانوا ملوكا سرير الشرق تحتهم فهل سألت سرير الغرب ما كانوا عالين كالشمس في أطراف دولتها في كل ناحية ملك وسلطان بالأمس قمت على الزهراء أندبهم واليوم دمعي على الفيحاء هتان لولا دمشق لما كانت طليطلة ولا زهد ببني العباس بغدان آمنت بالله آمنت بالله واستثنيت جنته دمشق روح وجنات وريحان قال الرفاق وقد هبت خمائلها الأرض دار لها الفيحاء بستان جرى وصفق يلقانا بها بردا كما تلقاك دون الخلد رضوان والطير تصدح والطير تصدح من خلف العيون بها وللعيون 
كما للطير الحان Rise and whisper to Damascus that you seek the traces of those who are no longer there. Narrate what the sons of Umayya have vanquished and that over which they have held sway. They were kings ruling over the land of the east. Have you asked of the west who they were? They were as high as the sun at its highest. Their dominion, their power conquered every land. Yesterday, I stood in Andalusia and Zahra and lamented the passing of their time. Today, my tears flow over the perfumed city of Damascus. If it were not for you, Damascus, Toledo never would have been, nor Abbasid Baghdad have shone so bright. I believe in God, but I exclude his paradise. Damascus is paradise. My friends said, when they breathed her flowers, that earth is a home and Damascus is her garden. The river Barada clapped and welcomed us as the angel Radwan welcomes souls to eternal heaven. Damascene birds sing in tune with springs and her springs pour forth in harmony. Saeed Aql. A distinguished Lebanese modernizer, he was also moved by the history, the beauty, and the magic of Damascus. Most of his poems to Damascus were sung by the great Fayrouz. He says, Shamu, Shamu ya the safe ulam yaribi, ya kalam al majdi fil kutubi. قبلك التاريخ في ظلمة بعدك استولى على الشهب شام أهلوك إذا هم على نوب قلبي على نوبي أنا أحبابي شعري لهم مثلما سيفي وسيف أبي أنا صوتي منك يا بردا سعيد عقل مش أنا أنا صوتي منك يا بردا مثل ما نبعك من سحبي ثلج حرمون غذانا معا شامخا كالعز في القبب أو شام أو eternal sword أو words of glory in the books before you history was in darkness after you, it has possessed the stars. O oh, Shem, when your people are in anguish, my heart is full of pain. My poetry is always for my loved ones, as my sword and my father's sword was. O oh, River Berada, you give me my voice, as my clouds give you your source. The snow on Mount Hermont stands aloft, like a dome of glory, encompassing us too. Badawi al Jabal, nice name for a poet, who came to Damascus as a young man and fell in love with it, or may I say, fell in love with her. He wrote tens of poems singing her glory. He says in one on the occasion of Eid al Jala, As Zagarid. فقد جن الإباء من صفات الله هذه الكبرياء بنت مروان اصطفاها ربها لا يشاء الله إلا ما تشاء هي في غسان بأس وندم وهي في الإسلام فتح وبلاء جمرة الحق جمرة الحق فسبحان الذي صاغ هذا الجمر من ظل وما أيها الدنيا ارشفي من كأسنا أيها الدنيا ارشفي من كأسنا إن عطر الشام من عطر السماء شهداء الحق في جنتهم هزهم للشام وجد ووفاء تضحك الربوة في أحلامهم 
هل عن الربوة في عدن غنى كلما هبت صبا من دمر رنح الجنة طيب وغناء واعذروا عدنا على غيرتها إنها والشام في الحسن سواء Bedawiya Jabal means the Bedouin of the mountain, by the way. It's a, it's a great name to translate that. Let us sing for joy, for our pride is divine. Damascus, daughter of Marwan, was chosen by God and he grants her every wish. Under the Ghassanid, Damascus was courage and generosity. Under Islam, she is excellence and conquest. She is the firebrand of truth and justice, and praise be to God who wrought this flame of shade and water. O mortal world, sip from our two glasses, for the nectar of Shem is the nectar of heaven. The martyrs for justice are shaken in their paradise by their passion and faith in you, O Shem. And they sleep in Eden with your garden of Rabwa laughing in their dreams. Whenever the western breeze of Dumma flows, heaven sways with joy and song. Forgive the Garden of Eden for her envy, for you and she, O Sham, are equals in beauty. And last is Nizar Qabbani, the son of Damascus, who said, Dimashku sana'atni, Damascus made me. His poetry is full of, his poetry is full of Damascus, and Damascus is full of his poetry. In a poem entitled Mufakira to Ashik and Dimashqi, the diary of a Damascene lover, he says, Farashtu, Farashtu fawqa tharaki tahira al-huduba, faya Dimashqu, limadha nabda ul-ataba, habibati anti, فاستلقي كأغنية على ذراعي ولا تستوضح السبب يا شام إن جراحي لا ضفاف لها فمسحي عن جبين الحزن والتعب حبي هنا وحبيباتي ولدنا هنا فمن يعيد لي العمر الذي ذهب أنا قبيلة عشاق بكاملها أنا قبيلة عشاق بكاملها ومن دموعي سقيت البحر والسحب هذه البساتين كانت بين أمتعتي لما ارتحلت عن الفيحاء مغتربة دمشق دمشق يا كنز أحلامي ومروحتي أشكو العروبة أم أشكو لك العربة يا شام يا شام ما في جعبتي طرب أستغفر الشعر أن يستجدي الطرب. I lay my lashes over your chaste earth. O oh, Damascus, why do we start to blame each other? You are my beloved. Lie on my arm like a song and do not ask me why. O oh, Sham, my wounds are boundless. Wipe the sadness, this fatigue from my brow. My love is here. My beloved are born here. Who would give me back the time which passed? I am a whole tribe of lovers, and my tears feed the sea and the clouds. Whenever I left you, Damascus, I carried your sweet gardens in my bag. O oh, Damascus, treasure of my dreams, shall I bemoan the Arabs or their Arabism? O oh, Sham, O oh, Sham, I beg poetry's forgiveness. There are no more songs in my bag. Thank you very much indeed. I say, I say to potential student, come to Sawas and you will spend the whole term in your fourth year reading Arabic poetry. Thank you very much. And uh, let me thank once again our musicians, Gaman and Hab, who've played so beautifully for us on the quintessential 
instrumental Brilliant. coupling of oud and uh, frame drum. Brilliant. More? Microphone. Can you hear me okay, or? <laughs> you want me to shout? <clears throat> okay. But my concern is not Arab music as such, but rather Arabic and music. That is the way music and language intertwine, the way music uses language, and also the way the language speaks about music, the texts that deal with music. But first, let's begin with some, and with some poetry. This time, poetry from a thousand years ago and more, from, the, from Abu Firas, one of the great Abbasid poets of the 10th century. So this is a uh, setting, as you see, uh, the lines are typical of uh, uh, love poetry. This is a very well-known poem. So the lover asks a question and the beloved responds. I see that you refuse to weep. You, your characteristic is patience, forbearance. Does love have no power over you to enjoin or to deny? And the answer then comes. Yes, I do feel longing and the pangs of love, but for the likes of me, secrets are not. Singing these lines, the, the great voice of the last century, the Egyptian singer Um Kuthum. Now, this setting is, in a way, rather restrained, rather respectful, you might think. It's very much an appeal to what is felt to be a classical heritage, uh, a form that has cultural prestige. And the important thing here is the intimate bond between the text and the melody, and the way sometimes the text is segment segmented to have parts repeat to increase emphasis. That, of course, is a modern composition. 
the modern being a relative term. The recording was made about 1925, so getting on a bit as far as recordings go. But from the time of the poet himself, Abu Firas, we have no surviving melodies. So the question then is, what can we know about this tradition beyond the recording age? And that knowledge can only come to us well, partly from images, of course, uh, that's important, but especially from writing. And we have then a rich textual tradition of which I will just show you briefly a couple of examples. So this is a little bit of narrative from something called the Book of Songs, Kitab Lahani, also known as the Diwan al Arab, as well as poetry itself. So this is a story about the great singer, composer, teacher, uh, Ibrahim al Mausili, who was a favorite performer for the Caliph Harun al Rashid. And uh, this is an event where they went off to, to Raqqa, when you could still go to Raqqa and be civilized and to drink wine. Uh, incidentally, I should add that there's a, uh, an extensive literature also in Arabic uh, telling you that uh, indulging in music is uh, not a good thing to do. It's morally suspect. It's associated with wine and with sexuality, and it's pervaded and uh, performed by dissolute people. So best avoid it. But there's also a counter literature that says, no, as long as you can avoid impure thoughts, it's perfectly okay, and it can even help you to attain spiritual awareness. So both, both these currents are present. In this story, there's a continuation. The merchant spills some wine uh, on his pouring. But he says, oh, don't worry about that. Just tell me, why is your song so sad? Has someone died? And Ibrahim goes off to Arashid and tells him the story. And Arashid just bursts out laughing. And the reason, we must assume, is that the wine merchant really doesn't appreciate the subtlety and beauty of the song. And where would that reside? Why should it be uh, not sad and so forth? And that probably resides in the technical features of the song, which are given at the bottom. So this work will often tell us not just who composed the song, but what melodic type it is and what rhythm it has. But how might we know what these are like? And for that, we would have to turn to a theoretical literature, some of which is quite complicated, but not all of it. And we can see, for example, one description of this particular rhythm. And it turns out to be a rather light and quick rhythm described in this form. So it's then, if you like, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And the description is quite coherent. It might actually be wrong, but that's another story. But you see how, it, how it's described. So you've got a, a technical description of the different uh, types of uh, attack, and then a very clear statement of the durations between each attack. And from that, we can get a fairly clear picture of the wide range of uh, rhythms that were in use at the time. The other side is the melodic side. How does one describe that kind of thing? Well, some texts are extremely impenetrable almost. They will give very complex arithmetic statements of different interval sizes 
measuring out the length of a string that's needed to be divided in such and such a way to produce the various notes. But others are more straightforward. And this is an example from a 14th century text from Cairo. And you see, we have a, a description that looks really rather too simple, perhaps. So the theory that the nucleus of this particular mode, or maqam, if you prefer, duka, is just two notes. And of course, that's derived from the actual name, which is uh, the Persian uh, form, including the word do, the number two. So uh, evidently, they're going to call it uh, a two-note uh, cycle or mode. And uh, then they're distinguished in terms of their position, uh, in terms of pitch. But as you see, there's a slightly more complex form which adds uh, further information. So we can get a little idea of the kind of melodic shape that would serve as the basis for a song. It doesn't get us very far, but uh, some way. And that's all the theory that I want to inflict upon you. I know that you want to get away and um, enjoy uh, other things. But I'd like you also to listen to a bit more music before you do. So to end, uh, I'd like to actually play another performance by Um Kuthum. This is from a little later in her career. But there's a very big difference here. We now move from the classical language with that kind of reverential solemnity to the setting to colloquial. This is a poem by the great Baramatunsi, the mid 20th century popularizer in a way of the colloquial as a serious uh, literary medium. And again, it's, a, it's a, a love poem. It's the plaint of the discarded lover. And it starts with sort of three blows of fate. The first, the second, and the third. So it begins, The first is that they snared me into love and passion. And the second, they ordered me to be subservient. And the third, they just went off and abandoned me. <laughs> now, that part I'm not going to play. It's a fairly slow setting, a little bit ponderous, perhaps like the first one we heard. But then there's a shift, and things come alive in a way they don't before. And this is partly because of the ambience, the atmosphere. You can hear the audience. You can see how the singer builds up excitement. This is an absolute example of the creation of this keyword, tarab. And it's done by a shift in the rhythm, and it's done by the voice just letting loose creatively, repeating, fragmenting the text, and appealing directly, because it's the colloquial language, to the heart of the man in the street, not to the literary elite. So what we're going to get here is the way two lines are taken uh, and fragmented and repeated and built upon. I placed my heart, I placed my hand upon my heart. When I was saying farewell to my only love. And I say to my eye, help me, my eye, and be generous with your tears. And it's that central phrase, that gets worked upon and worked upon. And um, I hope you'll uh, appreciate the way this builds and builds as the audience responds more and more, and then it, at a certain point explodes. And if we've got time, there's a second wave that goes even further. But I leave that to Professor Abdul Halim to uh, control uh, as to whether we get that far. Anyway, here is the first um, stretch.
this as we have been. I must now welcome Dr. Abdelaziz, uh, the questions and answers, just very few questions and answers before we go to have the delicious food, all provided by the Saudi <laughs> Cultural Bureau. So, any questions and answers, but indeed, questions, indeed, direct, short questions, not any long comments. Thank you. Stop this because it's, you can't see anything if you just stand there. Yeah. Hello? Any questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, I have a question. It's very entertaining, uh, but less educational, but more entertaining and informative. But I want to know one thing about the last which you have said about the King Fahad chair in the SOAS. Can you explain and elaborate these things? Yeah. This is a very important chair. It was donated by the king, who was a Muslim man, in 1995. And it has been very active indeed right from the beginning, because it's not just the chair uh, person, it entails all the creators of the center of Islamic studies and entails also the creation of a new. In Islamic studies, the center worked as the portal for the Islamic studies at SOAS. We have taught uh, Islamic studies for years and years at SOAS, spread all over the school in different departments. The center is the focus of all this, and it's a quite active center. We have the journal of Quranic studies, the only journal of Quranic studies in the West, so far, especially three times a year. And we hold Quran conferences on the Quran, on the Hadith, on Islamic law, and we hold cultural evenings like this, which is very pleasing to everybody. I hope this is enough for you. Now, any other questions? Can I have the microphone? Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> Dr. Abdul Halim and everybody, thank you very much indeed. I am Dr. Abdullah al um, it was a very entertaining and very nice uh, evening, and I'm very pleased to be here in SOAS, and it's really, really informative. It contains a good lecture, good uh, music, good speakers. It's excellent, well organized. I got a small question for Professor. He was describing, definition Bedou. He said, Bedou are the people from the Arabian Peninsula. Well, I don't know. Is that a very precise uh, definition or not? Because it's written in the Quran uh, when uh, Yusuf was uh, telling his uh, uh, brothers, وَجَاءَ بِكُمْ مِنَ الْبَدُو Al-Badu, they were in Sinai. So not every Badu has to come from Saudi, from the Arabian Peninsula. Am I right or am I wrong? Just a, a very small clarification. Thank you. Well, um, sorry. Does this work? Yes. Um, at the, at the present, there are Bedouins in Sinai as well. Um, and, you know, the, I, I wasn't trying to say that their origin is from the Arabian Peninsula, purely that the, the dialect 
that they speak is the same as, as Nejd and, and the Bedouin in the north. But yes, there are, Be there are Bedouin in Sinai too, I believe, even now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Very important in Islamic culture and the Arabic literature, the Bedouin. We have it all in poetry, and we have the, uh, the Islamic law. Even the right chapter to look at it in Bedouin, Bedouin right, and so on. Mm -hmm. I am very pleased when I go to some of these countries to visit areas where Bedouin are still there. OK? Any other questions? Hello. Um, thank you very much for this, uh, this evening. Uh, my question is to Mr. Mohammed and Sophia. Thank your poetry was really moving. Um, I found myself sitting here feeling quite sad hearing the poetry, but I didn't know all the words. But I sat there thinking of your Arabic recitation, and is there any significance in the fact that a vow in Arabic is a harakat, and harakat means movement? Um, and like to move, you know, and I maybe have some more of a metaphysical question than anything, but I the word lament came in my mind actually as you were reciting that. So I, it's more of a comment and a couple of questions within me. But um, thank you very much for your poetry. Well, thank you, thank you for the comment. And if you are a student of Sawas. I will ask you to come and join us and take some courses with us. If you are not, think of applying. Uh, I can, I can now, I can now wear the other hat, the hat of the admission tutor, and do some other work. Please, anybody here who's interested in studying Arabic in Sawas at the BA level or the MA level, email me. I'll announce my email loudly now. MS15 at sawas.ac.uk. Tariq Hassan, an award winning artist. If we were to resurrect all the poets who are dead within the centuries, what will we be doing? All the situation and the source? I didn't catch the question. If we were to resurrect all the poets who are dead within the centuries, what should we be doing? The, the institution and the source? To resurrect, to resurrect all the poets. The poets have died. Their poetry is still alive. Oh, there's a question no. here, Dr. Farid. Dr. Farid. Okay, once again, then, once again, I yes. to welcome and thank Professor Dr. Abdelabi for our study. Uh, am I allowed to uh, start? <laughs> to have a brief uh, comment, Professor? Allowed to do what? To give a brief comment. It is <laughs> legal. Uh, thank you very much for the entertaining evening. And uh, I have just a few points of details to Professor Wright that uh, the um, presentation of Umm uh, Kulthum and Awaq Asir Dam is a very good classical uh, example in the 20s by Sheikh Abu Laila Muhammad. But uh, Riyadh Sumbati had tried the same thing mm. in the 60s mm -hmm. with a different uh, approach and uh, more modern. Mm. Could be in the next time presentation, good point to, to give some comparison between the two to yes, see how would. things develop. The other thing is mm. the I, last song. Can I just tell you, I rather prefer the earlier. 
I, I am like you, but you and, and, and I, I do as well. <laughs> Both are good anyway. The last uh, thing is that song by uh, Biram Tunsi, mm. and the music was by Sheikh Zakaria Ahmed. Yes, I should have said that. Yeah, Thank you. The, uh, the beloved is not uh, the beloved, but it is the only son of Biram who passed away, and he wrote this out of, you know, that strong feeling. And uh, Zakaria had uh, reacted with a very uh, impressive or exp expressive uh, song, and Umu Kulsum, of course, yeah. mastered the whole thing. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, once again, yes, I would like to thank Professor Masashi and our colleagues from the Saudi Embassy as well. The Cultural Bureau has provided the excellent tool we will use now